Hello! The purpose of this video is to train new students how to use some of the basic equipment that you'll be using in the lab. For example, if you ever need to transfer liquid volumes, you'll probably use a pipetter, also known as a pipette. Pipettes come in a range of sizes and can accurately transport volumes as small as 0.2 or as large as 1000 microliters. The volume range of each pipette is shown on top of its plunger. For example, this P20 pipette can transfer 2 to 20 microliters. Sometimes only the maximum volume of the pipette is shown on the plunger, but the volume range of all pipettes is tenfold, so this pipette transfers 10 to 100 microliters. To change the volume setting on a pipette, rotate the black knob near the top, as shown here. Note that since this is a P1000 pipette, one of the digits is shown in red to indicate milliliters. The other two digits are shown in black for microliters. Right now the pipette is set to 1 ml. On a P20 pipette, one of the digits is red to represent nanoliters, while the other two digits are shown in black for microliters. In this example, the pipette is set to 18.7 microliters. On a P2 pipette, two of the digits are shown in red and one is in black for microliters. In this example, the pipette is currently set to 1.32 microliters. Just as pipettes have unique volume ranges, they also require unique tips. For example, this P1000 requires large blue tips. Always make sure that the tips fit on snugly. If the tips fit on loosely or fall off, then they won't work properly and you'll need to find some other tips. Pipettes use a two-stop plunger system to transfer liquids. The first stop, as shown here, is used to draw up the liquid. The second stop is used to completely eject the liquid from the tip. So once again, the first stop is used to draw up liquid, while the second stop is used to eject it. When transferring a sample, begin by pushing the plunger down to the first stop to eject all of the air. Then submerge the tip and release the plunger. As you eject the sample, push all the way to the second stop to make sure that all the liquid leaves the tip. When you are done using the tip, eject it into a sharps box using the ejector button, as shown here. If your pipette does not have a working ejector button, you can always take off the tip manually by hand. If you ever think a pipette is inaccurate, you can test it using an analytical balance. In this example, we're going to test a P1000 pipette by setting it to 700 microliters. Since the density of water is 1 gram per ml, 700 microliters of water should weigh 700 milligrams. Begin by tearing a weigh boat and then slowly transferring the liquid volume to the weigh boat. Make sure you completely eject all of the liquid, then close the doors on the analytical balance and wait for the reading to stabilize. In this case, the reading is only 541 milligrams, which is much less than the expected 700 milligrams. Therefore, the pipette is in dire need of calibration. You should no longer use the pipette for any experiments and immediately let your supervisor know that the pipette needs to be calibrated. If you need to transfer volumes larger than 1 ml, you'll need to use a pipette aid. Pipette aids use much larger tips with volume ranges from 2 to 50 ml. Begin by tightly inserting the tip into the pipette aid, then submerge the tip into the liquid. Draw liquid up with the top button and eject liquid with the bottom button. If at any point you draw liquid too far up, the pipette will stop working. This is because all pipette aids use an air filter to protect themselves from liquid contamination. Therefore, to get the pipette aid working again, you have to disassemble the pipette head and remove the clogged filter, as shown here. Once you've removed the clogged filter, you'll need to replace it with a new filter. Note that syringe filters designed for liquid will not work properly in a pipette aid. You must use the air filter specifically designed for your pipette aid. Once you have removed the old clogged filter and thoroughly dried all of the plastic pieces, reassemble the pipette aid, making sure that the new filter and all the rubber pieces are in the correct orientation. Once you put it back together, test it with some liquid to make sure that it works. If the pipette aid continues to malfunction, let your supervisor know immediately. 
In addition to transferring liquid volumes, you also have to weigh out a variety of chemicals in your research. To do so, we use balances. Most labs have two types of balances, a crude balance for large masses and an analytical balance for very small masses. It is very important that you only weigh large masses on the crude balance and small masses on the analytical balance. This is because large masses will actually break the analytical balance, while the crude balance is not accurate enough to precisely weigh small masses. To weigh masses larger than one gram, use a weigh boat. Insert the weigh boat into the analytical balance, close all the doors, and tear it to set the mass to zero. Then add your chemical. To weigh masses smaller than a gram, use a weighing paper. Weighing papers are preferred because they cling less to small powders and crystals. Transfer your chemical to the weigh paper using a clean spatula or scupula as shown here. Slowly add the chemical to the weigh paper to prevent going over the desired weight. Check the exact weight by closing the doors on the analytical balance and giving it a few seconds to stabilize. As long as your spatula is clean, you may return any excess chemical to the original bottle it came from. If you are ever weighing out a chemical and you accidentally spill some of it on the balance or bench, you'll need to clean it up immediately. Begin by removing your weighed out chemical from the balance. Then use a brush to clean up any spilt powder or crystals. Once you have it all cleaned up, make sure you properly dispose of the chemical. Just like a pipetter, an analytical balance can also become inaccurate over time. To test the accuracy of an analytical balance, you'll need two standardized weights at the upper and lower bounds of the balance. In this case, we're using 2 and 50 gram weights. Notice that the 2 gram weight is reading 1.998 grams, which is less than 1% inaccurate, so that's pretty good. Next, we test the 50 gram weight, which weighs out to be 49.95 grams. This is also greater than 99.9% .9 accurate, so the balance is working properly. If these readings were significantly off, we would need to calibrate the balance. Refer the manufacturer's instructions on how to do so, or let your supervisor know immediately. So just to review, use crude balances for large weights, which is typically anything over about 5 grams. Use analytical balances for any small weights, anything from 0.1 milligram all the way up to a gram. And please clean off the balances and the bench if you spill any chemicals. Centrifuges are also commonly found in most labs. They're used to separate particles of different densities by spinning them rapidly to generate a high g-force. Since most centrifuges do operate at rather high speeds, it is important that you know how to properly use them to avoid damaging the centrifuge or harming yourself. The most important thing you need to know about using a centrifuge is that any samples you put on the rotor must be properly balanced. Use an analytical balance to make sure the weights of your samples are equivalent and adjust them as necessary. If you ever have an odd number of samples, you can always use a tube of water to even things out. When putting your samples on the rotor, make sure they are exactly opposite one another, otherwise you'll get an imbalance error. Next, put a lid on the rotor just in case any of your samples leak out. To set the speed on the centrifuge, always begin by selecting either g-force or rpm for revolutions per minute. Note that g-force may also be shown as RCF for relative centrifugal force. Next, set the time on the centrifuge and start the run. You should always stick around to watch the centrifuge reach maximum speed, just in case there's any kind of imbalance error. Once the centrifuge has finished, wait for the rotor to completely stop spinning, then remove your samples. You should always check your samples to make sure the desired sedimentation has occurred. When you're done with the centrifuge, Put the rotor lid back in place and close the main lid. Whenever you're using larger centrifuges that use buckets or 50 ml tubes, it is important that you only fill them up to about 80% of their maximum volume. For instance, here we're only filling up the 50 ml tube to 40 ml. This is because tubes and buckets do not have perfect seals. Therefore, when they're spun at high speeds, they can leak out if they're overfilled. 
So to prevent making a huge mess that you have to clean up in the centrifuge, only fill up 50 ml tubes to 40 ml and fill 600 ml buckets to around 400 ml. So just to review, when using a centrifuge, always make sure that your samples are properly balanced. And finally, when using 50 ml tubes or large buckets, only fill them to 80% of their maximum volume to prevent any spills that might happen in the centrifuge. If a spill does occur, make sure that you clean it up immediately. The most important thing you need to know about a pH meter is that the electrode must be stored in electrode storage solution in between uses. If the electrode storage solution runs dry, then the pH meter will stop working properly and the electrode may even break. If you ever notice that the storage solution is run dry, immediately fill it back up with fresh electrode storage solution. Several companies offer pre-made storage solutions, or you can make your own by mixing 100 milligrams of potassium chloride with 10 ml of the pH4 standard solution. When you are ready to use the electrode, remove it from the storage solution and thoroughly dry it with a chem wipe. Next, rinse off the electrode with milliq water and dry it again. To calibrate the meter, pour a little bit of the standard solution into a 15 ml tube. This prevents the main standard solution from becoming contaminated. You can refer to the manufacturer's instructions for specific protocols on how to calibrate your pH meter. However, in general, pH standard solutions of 4, 7, and 10 are usually used to calibrate pH meters. When calibrating the meter, it is important that you use the two standard solutions that are closest to the pH of your buffer. For example, if you plan on making a sample with a pH of 6, you want to calibrate with the 4 and 7 standards. However, if the pH of your buffer will be 8.5, then you want to calibrate the meter with the pH 7 and 10 standard solutions. To measure pH, completely submerge the tip of the electrode into your solution and ensure that it is vigorously mixed. The best way to do this is to use a stir bar and a stir plate, but you can do it with your hand if those are unavailable. Remember to press the read button on the pH meter and give it a little while to stabilize. Once the reading has stabilized, you can adjust the pH of the solution with hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide. Note that hydrochloric acid will decrease the pH while sodium hydroxide will raise the pH. In either case, add the acid or base in small amounts and vigorously mix the solution after you add them. It is important that you add the acid and base in very small amounts such that you don't overshoot and have to add excess acid and base. This will prevent you from adding too much salt to your solution. Once you are done titrating your solution, remember to put the electrode back into the storage solution. I'd like to stop for a moment to talk specifically about buffers. The purpose of a buffer is to maintain the pH of a solution, even though a reaction may be occurring that would otherwise raise or lower the pH. The most important thing you need to know about buffers is that they are only effective within specific pH ranges. For example, bis-tris buffer is only effective between pH 5.8 and 7.3. Therefore, if you titrate it to pH 8, it will not resist pH change effectively. Instead, if you need to make a buffer at pH 8, it would be better to use Tris HCl, which has a range from 7.2 to 9. It is important to mention that the buffers shown in this table are only a small sampling of all the buffers available. You can find many more online which may be useful for your experiments. Aside from the pH range of a buffer, you should also consider its chemical reactivity. For example, Tris buffers are weak chelators, that means they will weakly bind metal ions. In addition, HEAPS buffers generate free radicals that can significantly interfere with your chemical reaction if exposed to sunlight. Therefore, you should always remember to check the pH range and the reactivity of your buffer just to make sure it's ideal for the reaction that you're trying to do. If you work with any hazardous chemicals in your research, you'll probably need to use the fume hood at some point. 
to begin working in the fume hood, raise the sash to the maximum safe height. Note that if you raise it too high, the fume hood will not work properly and some vapors may escape into the lab. When you raise the sash, it should start drawing air inwards. If there is no airflow or any alarms go off in the hood, you should let your supervisor know immediately and not use the fume hood. When performing experiments in the fume hood, you should always work at least six inches deep. This will prevent any vapors from accidentally escaping from the fume hood. In addition, you should always keep the fume hood as clean and empty as possible. This will prevent hazardous chemicals from cross-reacting from one another, and it will ensure that the vents that you can see in the back of the fume hood here will remain unblocked and working properly. Remember, if these vents become blocked, the fume hood may lose suction and hazardous vapors may escape into the lab. So, to review, before working in the fume hood, always check the airflow of the hood. You should also work six inches deep at all times and try not to block any of the vents inside of the fume hood. Another commonly used piece of equipment in all of our labs is the UltraPure water system. UltraPure water should be used for all of your buffers, since tap water and even distilled water may have some contaminants that could interfere with your reactions. To collect UltraPure water, Place the dispensing hose inside your bottle and pull the trigger as shown here. Do not let bottles fill up on the bench. Instead, put them in the sink just in case you forget about them and they overflow. Please note that if you do leave a bottle on the bench and it overflows, it can flood the lab, thereby damaging or ruining many expensive pieces of lab equipment. When collecting ultra-pure water, you should always check the readout on the system to ensure that the water is ultra-pure. UltraPure water has a resistivity of 18.2 mega ohms per centimeter, as shown on the readout here. If the resistivity is any lower, that means your water is not UltraPure and one of the filters in the system will likely need to be replaced. Notify your supervisor if this is the case. Also notify your supervisor if you observe any alarms on the system. Once you have your UltraPure water, you probably use a stir plate to make your solution. Begin by inserting a stir bar that isn't too big or too small for the bottle. Then slowly turn up the RPMs and add your chemical that you wish to dissolve. In some cases, you may wish to heat the sample as well. Please remember to use extreme caution when heating liquids on a hot plate. For example, do not heat water above its boiling point, which can be 90 to 100 degrees C, unless you are explicitly trying to boil it. Volatile solvents should only be heated in the chemical fume hood to avoid inhalation of any harmful vapors. Finally, hot plates should not be left on at high temperatures for extended periods of time. For example, try not to leave a hot plate on overnight since it is not uncommon for hot plates to overheat and create a fire hazard when left unattended. So that's the end of this video. I hope it's been useful. Please contact your advisor if you have any more questions on any of these pieces of equipment.